All right, let's talk about hacking the one playbook that governs the entire web. And no, I'm not talking about some hidden forum post. I'm talking about the official rulebook, RFC 9110. Now, most developers, they see a manual. We're going to look at it and see a complete map of the attack surface. So let's get into it. So right from the get-go, the authors of the RFC give us this massive clue. HTTP is just an interface. Think of it like a window. It's how you look at and talk to a resource. It's not the resource itself. And for us as pen testers, that little separation is everything. It tells us that the real security isn't in the protocol. It's in how the server behind that window decides to handle our requests. But, you know, this interface isn't some chaotic free-for-all. It's got very specific rules. The RFC lays out the exact syntax and, more importantly, the intended use for all of our messages. But here's the catch. It doesn't control what the server actually does with them. And that gap right there, the gap between the official rules and the real-world implementation, that's our playground. And this, this is where it really gets fun for us. Every single rule, every constraint, every single defined behavior is a potential opportunity. We're basically hunting for two things, applications that straight up break the rules and, even better, chances to abuse the rules in ways the developers just never saw coming. That's the pen tester's mindset. Okay, so let's start our playbook with the methods that the RFC itself labels as safe. Our whole mission here is pretty simple. Find clever ways to make these supposedly harmless read-only methods do some very, very unsafe things. First things first, what does the RFC even mean by safe? Well, the intent is that these methods are for looking, not touching. They shouldn't change anything, they shouldn't create anything, they shouldn't delete anything on the server. In theory, you could run them all day and nothing bad would happen. But, you know, we're here to test that theory. And here's the lineup. Get, head, options, and trace. The RFC calls them safe. You'll also see they're all marked as idempotent. Now that's a key concept. It just means you can fire off the request once or a hundred times and the server state should end up exactly the same. Think about a web crawler. It depends on this. For us though, that safe label, that's not a guarantee. That's a challenge. So let's start with a big one, get. Its job is simple, get data. But as a pen tester, we see a couple of immediate problems. First, any sensitive data you stick in the URL, like a session token, gets logged everywhere. Proxies, browser history, server logs, it's a mess. Second, and this is a classic, the RFC says a GET request should not have a request body. It doesn't say must not. That's a loophole. It's an open invitation to try and smuggle a malicious request body past a front-end server, hoping the back-end server is lazy and processes it anyway. That's textbook request smuggling. Next up, options. Developers use it to see what a server can do. We use it for stealthy recon. It's perfect. A simple options request to an API endpoint, say, flash API users, might come back with an allow header. And maybe that header says get, post, and delete. Uh-oh, just like that with one harmless looking request, we've discovered a potentially dangerous method is enabled and we've got our next target. Then you've got trace. It's designed to be a simple diagnostic tool. All it does is echo back the exact request the server received. You see where this is going, right? It's a feature just waiting to become a bug. If we can trick a victim's browser into sending a trace request, the server's response will echo back the victim's request including all their headers and cookies, even HTTP-only ones. That is the essence of a cross-site tracing, or XST attack. All right, enough poking around with the safe stuff. Let's move on to the real workhorse of the web, the post request. This is our go-to tool for actually changing things and making the server do work. According to the RFC, post is for submitting data that the server is gonna process based on its own internal rules, and notice it is not item potent. Sending the same post twice might mean you buy something twice or post the same comment twice. That flexibility is exactly why it's a total gold mine for bugs. That data handling process on the slide, for us, that screams SQL injection. Appending data, a perfect place to hide some cross-site scripting payloads. Every single intended use is a potential attack. And this quote right here, this is so important. The RFC draws a super clear line between post and put. 
With POST, you're politely asking the server, hey, could you please process this data for me? But with PUT, with PUT, you're giving a direct command, take this file and put it right here. That huge difference in intent is our bridge to the really destructive stuff. Which brings us to PUT and DELETE. Now we're talking. These methods are literally designed to create, replace, and destroy content. If we can find these enabled on a server without proper checks, well, it's like being handed the keys to the kingdom. So here's the classic web shell attack using put step by step. First, we find an endpoint where put is turned on, probably using that option scan we talked about earlier. Then we cook up a little web shell in PHP or whatever the server runs. The magic is in the request itself. We send put slash we you uploads slash shell dot PHP and stick our malicious code in the request body. We are literally telling the server, create a file at this exact path and use my content. If we get back a 201 created response, it's game over. We just browse to that URL and run whatever commands we want. But what happens when our attack fails? You know, a well-configured server can fight back. Following the RFC's own advice, it can check the content type header. So in our web shell attack, if we send a content type of application slash XPHP, but the server is only configured to accept, say, JPEGs, it'll just reject our request flat out and hit us with this, a 415 unsupported media type error. Attack shut down. And here's another common defense we have to know how to get around. An application can use this header if none match, star. It's a conditional request that basically tells the server, hey, only go through with this put request if a file at this target location does not already exist. It's designed to stop you from accidentally overriding something important, like the home page. So if our put requests keep failing, we have to remember to check if the server is using conditional headers like this against us. And then there's delete. It's a brutally simple weapon. There's no fancy payload, no complex trickery. The entire attack is just about finding an endpoint where the authorization is broken. Our whole job is to find a URL like slash API slash users slash one and just see if sending a delete request actually works when it shouldn't. If the application isn't checking who we are, we can do some serious, serious damage. Okay, time for one of the more specialized tools in the box, the connect method. Now you're not gonna use this every single day, but in the right situation, it is an incredibly powerful way to pivot and move through a target's network. So what the connect method does is it tells a server, usually it's a proxy server, to open up a raw direct TCP tunnel to some other destination. And once that tunnel is established, the proxy just blindly forwards traffic back and forth. For an attacker, this is absolute gold a poorly configured proxy suddenly becomes our personal gateway, letting us bypass firewalls and connect directly to internal services like databases or admin panels that are supposed to be completely unreachable from the outside. So what's stopping us from just using every proxy on the internet as our personal tunnel? Well, a lot of the time, it's this status code 407 proxy authentication required. Before a properly configured proxy will open that tunnel for you, it's gonna demand a username and password. This right here is the main gatekeeper that we have to figure out how to defeat if we want to abuse the connect method. Okay, so let's pull it all together. The real lesson here, the thing I really want you to take away, is a shift in mindset. We've just walked through how to look at the HTTP rulebook not as a set of boring limitations, but as a highly detailed map of the entire web attack surface. And look, this isn't some secret interpretation we invented. The authors of the RFC spelled it out for us themselves. Right there in the security consideration section, they literally warned that an attacker could build a request that might be misinterpreted as a command. They handed us the threat model on a silver platter. So what's the bottom line? First, treat the RFC like your field guide. It's an attack surface map. Second, remember that so-called safe methods like get and options are your recon tools for leaking information. Third, the idempotent methods like put and delete. They're powerful, but they're predictable. They either work or they don't. But post, the non-idempotent method, that's where you gotta get creative because that's where you'll find those unpredictable logic flaws. Every single rule is a clue. In the end, RFC 9110 is so much more than a technical document. It defines the entire battlefield.
It gives you the language, it gives you the logic, and it gives you the rulebook for the modern web. So the only real question left is, with this map in your hands, what vulnerabilities are you going to find next?